Okay, so hello everyone. I am Gerardo Gonzalo, a research master's student in computer and technical neuroscience. Today I have the pleasure to welcome to the interview series of the Biennial Congress of the European Behavioral Pharmacology Society, uh, David Nat, Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology at the Imperial College of London, and Dan Ramakes, Professor of Psychopharmacology and Behavioral Toxicology at Massachusetts University. Thank you both for being here today. And well, the idea is to have a discussion about different statements with, with drug harms and drug policies, as this will be the topic of the panel in which you will both uh, will be involved during the conference. Okay, so the first statement uh, is, are psychedelics as effective in treating depression as traditional antidepressants? Well, shall I start with that one, Jan? Sure, absolutely. So we have just finished the first head-to-head -head uh, where we compared psilocybin, 25 milligram, two doses, three weeks apart, against escitalopram, which is the, uh, I think most people would say the gold standard SSRI, 10 milligrams for three weeks, then building up to a high dose, 20 milligrams. And overall, um, psilocybin did rather well on most measures of outcome. It actually did better than escitalopram, and it was also faster in terms of its activity. So I think we can say it looks as if psychedelics in a population of people who want to take them, who volunteered to take them, uh, are, is, are at least as good as the standard treatment for mild to moderate depression. I don't know if you have any comments really with that, Dan? Yeah, so I, I agree on that statement. And of course, uh, that, that study that David is talking about was just published and got a lot of interest. Um, in a way, it was somewhat unfortunate that you have to make a choice on your primary outcome measure, which in this case, somewhat, uh, well, it's not the wrong choice, it was a good choice, but there was a lot of secondary measure that actually showed the difference. And the one that, that struck me the most was that the remission rates yes. of psilocybin were uh, twice as high as those in the, in the uh, SSRI group. Exactly. Uh, so you can you can discuss and you know which outcome parameter is most uh, worthful, right? And I think remission rates is really what you're looking for, right? You try you try to treat the depression. Re reduction is nice, but you want to have people in a remission. Exactly. So it's uh, it's in the end, it's all about the formulating what is your prime outcome measure, right? Yeah, it was. We went with the quid self-report. <clears throat> it was the primary outcome measure in the STAR-D, you know, so it was, a, it was a measure that we were very familiar with. But uh, it's, uh, subsequently, we've looked at it in more detail. It doesn't have quite the same um, psychometric properties as some of the other scales. But I think overall, the rate, yeah, I mean, we didn't power the study to beat escitalopram. We were just interested to see how it would compare. And it actually, psilocybin compared extremely well. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm fairly happy that people will see what we did and realize that there's, it's, there's definitely, it's definitely worth pursuing psychedelic therapy as a research tool in depression. Uh, and even if the uh, therapeutic efficacy is, is equal, right, the, the, the side effect profile is so much better for, for psilocybin as compared to an SSRI, that even based on, on the adverse event profile, you will already decide maybe we should go for psilocybin. Well, I'm in favor of that. And of course, you in the Netherlands are very, very lucky because you've got legal truffles. So you, people in Netherlands have a choice. In Britain, they don't have a choice because psilocybin is still illegal. And all those people that want to, you know, I've had, we published a, a, our film, not published, the film of, our, of the trial was, was shown on BBC Two two nights ago, and uh, if you get a chance to see it, and, uh, I know that you know you in the, in the Netherlands are very keen on the BBC because you you show it regularly. But if you get a chance to watch it, it's on Channel BBC Two. It's called the Psychedelic Drug Trial, and I've had you know probably fifty people write to me subsequently saying could they get the therapy, and the answer is they can't get it in Britain, but I tell them they can in the Netherlands. So you'll probably see an influx of people to your treatment centres in the next few weeks. Yeah, it's likely. It's likely. Yeah. It sound, sounds promising indeed. Um, so yeah, um, that being said, uh, the second statement that we thought about was um, if uh, liberal cannabis policies will increase cannabis related to harms. Well, I, I, I'm a great fan of the drugs. I started working on cannabis policy back in 1997 when I was on a, a major government review and we brought over several Dutch experts, including a Dutch policeman for, 
and we went to Amsterdam and we were absolutely so impressed with the Dutch approach. And what I'm going to tell you what I think the Dutch approach has achieved. I mean, I understand the Dutch approach was designed to separate the use of cannabis from the use of harder drugs by giving, having special places, coffee shops in which people can smoke cannabis. And the model was, has been brilliant. You know, it, it, you have way lower levels of hard drug, particularly of heroin use in your young people in Britain. Because in Britain, to get cannabis today, you have to go to a black market and you always, 95% of the time, get offered something else. You get cannabis plus heroin or crack. So I think the Dutch model is fabulous. And what's even more interesting about it is that you have lower levels of cannabis use in the Netherlands than we have, partly because you're not poisoning people with horrible forms of cannabis and other drugs that we are we're poisoning them with in Britain. Well, that's, I mean, it's an interesting discussion also now with the legalization of, uh, of uh, cannabis for medicinal and recreational use in, in the United States and particularly also Canada, right? There is this fear that because of that, that the harm of using cannabis might increase because the prevalence might increase. But if you look at the, the prevalence map in Europe and you look at the Netherlands indeed, where we have very liberal attitudes for at least three decades, you indeed see that the, the prevalence of use is lower than in many other uh, European countries that are much more rigid in, 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 their, in their policies uh, towards cannabis use. So I think that already demonstrates that the fact that you're liberal uh, towards the use of cannabis doesn't automatically mean that everybody runs to the coffee shop and starts using it. It's just not the case. Exactly. So I don't think that harms will, uh, will increase just by the fact that you allow people to use it. I think they go down. I think one of the problems, Britain has some of the highest levels of cannabis use, but, and we have a lot of dependence. Because 95, 94, 95% of all the cannabis sold in Britain, which is all sold illegally, is skunk. It's high. It's 15% or more. And that's much more dangerous. It's more addictive. It hasn't got the, the cannabidiol element. So in Britain, you can't get safe cannabis. You're forced to take dangerous stuff, I mean, which causes more problems. So, you know, it's a classic example of how prohibition makes drug use much more harmful. And also, the other aspect is that uh, so if you talk about the uh, synthetic cannabinoids, for example, you will be hard pressed to find them in the Netherlands to, because people are not selling it because people prefer cannabis over synthetic cannabinoids if they have the choice. But in other countries where you can't have access to cannabis, but where synthetic cannabinoids are legal, yeah, people are using synthetic cannabinoids, but their potencies are way higher and they're much more dangerous because people don't know what to expect and how much they actually inhale because they can't control the dosing. Yeah, so that's and a negative effect. We don't, you know, we, we have last year in Britain, I think we had 70 deaths from deaths in prisons from synthetic cannabis. Yeah never had a death in prison from cannabis. You know, it's, the synthetic cannabinoids are, I mean, truly the worst example of how cannabis, any prohibition probably, has actually driven a black market, which has become way more dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. And it would be interesting to know for other drugs such as MDMA. I think you then you had a paper related with that also. We've seen the same. We saw the same when, when the WHO tried to stop the manufacture of MDMA by blocking the uh, export of sassafras oil from uh, Cambodia and Thailand. The, the underground chemists in China, they didn't just say, oh, well, fair enough, I'll stop making the MDMA. No, they, they started making a variant called PMA, which we made from aniseed oil, which is way more toxic. So, you know, we had hundreds of deaths in Britain from PMA and PMMA, which were directly attributable to this absurd ban on, or the attempt to to stop the production of MDMA by banning the, the precursor. And then what's even worse is now the chemists have worked out how to, how to get bypass the saffron need, so they do it through another route. And now we, it's so cheap to make MDMA that the strength of MDMA tablets has gone up from you know, 18 milligrams to sometimes 360 milligrams. You know, so again, we've created deaths from a, a product which we didn't need and, and, and we facilitated access to much higher concentrations of MDMA. So it's been a double whammy and, and completely predictable if you, people had just talked to experts like us and learned the lessons of history. Okay, so the fourth statement, um, well, the third statement, sorry, is um, if GMP regulations should be abandoned in clinical drug trials. 
So I think the answer is yes. I think the, one of the problems that the uh, Europe or the EMA have imposed upon our research is by asking for GMP for phase one, phase two trials. The Swiss don't do it, the Americans don't do it, and they do things a lot faster than we can. And so absolutely, we don't, it, there's no point in it. You know, as long as the drug's essentially pure, you don't need, I mean, GMP production, if you go back historically, why do we have GMP production? That was driven by the fear of mad cow disease. We don't have mad cow disease anymore. So we don't need GMP production, for, certainly for, for, uh, for exploratory studies. Um, once you get a drug you can sell, then you can afford to do GMP. But the costs of GMP production are so disabling uh, to uh, preclinical or early clinical research that we should abandon it, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, um, so a lot of the work that we do is indeed phase one or phase two. And then quite often, they're not even pure medicinal drug studies, right? You're just trying to, to profile a compound, maybe just for safety reasons. But then, and, and there's not, not a single pharmaceutical industry that per se has an interest in that compound at that time. So it's impossible to follow those rules and regulations. And it's, you, know, you, can't, you can't afford it even because... GMP costs you something between 50,000 and 100,000 euros. Now, nobody, we don't have that in our laboratories. So, yeah, that's, it's really uh, somewhat uh, superfluous. And I, I totally agree that we should uh, try to avoid GMP whenever it is possible. Well, that might be the one benefit of Brexit. I mean, I'm very anti-Brexit, but the one benefit might be that we can actually break away from the EMA regulations. If you look at Germany, where, I mean, as we all know, you know, the Germans do obey the rules. And German psychedelic research has essentially never ever got off the ground because they force everything to be GMP. And it's virtually impossible to get GMP production of, the, of these psychedelic drugs. Huh. I feel I mean, very sorry for them. Even uh, you know, going back to psilocybin, right? It's try to get GMP formulation of psilocybin. I press you, it's not easy. No. It's no. really not easy. No, and in fact, the only sources now are, are the pharmaceutical companies who are developing it commercially, and then you get into all sorts of contractual challenges with them as well. So absolutely, let's get rid of GMP for real research. Just mm -hmm. have it for essentially clinical production. Exactly, yeah. I think if the attention is to, to, to develop a compound to like a, a drug that comes on the market, then there is a big industry behind it and they can pay for it and they can actually afford it. But if it's really research driven only, I don't think we need GMP. It's amazing how it's slowing down the process of just studying these drugs. Um, yeah, so the fourth statement that we thought about is how would you bring ayahuasca to the market? And in case you do, how would you decriminalize it? Well, I, I, you, yeah. Yeah, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Okay. I mean, you just decriminalize it, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to do. You just need to decriminalize it. What's the, in the same way as the Dutch decriminalized the truffle. Yeah, I mean, come, you know, I mean, but to bring it to market, that's a difficult, I mean, I, I don't, I think I don't, I'm open-minded about it. I suspect that the, what is happening now in terms of retreats and in, you know, uh, in terms of group therapy in country, in South America and, uh, and also in Spain, and I think probably also now in the Netherlands, that's probably the way to go. I don't think any company is ever gonna develop an ayahuasca capsule to sell. I don't think they could. I don't think the regulators would allow it. So I, the same way, the same reason they won't allow us to research it because we can't prove its consistency. So I think it's going to be a parallel process. What do you think, Ian? I think it's, uh, I, I, I think pharmaceutical companies don't like it because there's more than one ingredient uh, in, in, in the products and that makes it uh, difficult. Mm. But at the same time, I don't think it's impossible. It's costly, I suppose, but uh, there is, um, the parallel would be maybe a Sativex, which is also plant-based uh, material. So and what is that? Sorry, Jan, Jan, I didn't get that. Oh, Sativex, Sativex. Oh, Sativex, sorry, yes. Sativex. So that, that is plant-based and standardized quality. Uh, I mean, that takes a lot of time and effort to develop it, but so it is possible. So I think uh, Ayahuasca could follow that same route if somebody put the money into it and it was really determined to, to develop it. Um, and then um, you might not use, if, if, if I was going to do that, I wouldn't be using harmaline as the MAOI, I'd be using meclobamide. I'd, I'd be using something which is proven to be safe and, and we know the dose-effect relationship. Yeah. 
Yeah, true. Yeah, that, that's another thing with the Harmon lines, right? You need to be very uh, careful about the dosing uh, that, uh, yes, yes. that you give. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's inter in that respect, it's interesting to see that Harmon line as such is actually used as a mo model for tremor, right? Yes. So, uh, so uh, harm lines as such, uh, I mean, there may away inhibitors, and that's great in the contact, but as, uh, as, a, as a compound on their own, they also have some risk associated with them. Yes. I mean, they probably interfere with the GABA system as well. You know, so the, yeah. I'd be surprised if harmaline could be a drug in the sense of a conventional drug. Yeah, true. Yeah. So there's a lot of challenges there, uh, Gerardo. It seems like so. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of research to do in there. Indeed. But I mean, even in the uh, uh, in the, the recreational communities, right? People are what people drink as ayahuasca is not a traditional ayahuasca. It's, it's quite often a mixture of, of other, other plants that have similar qualities. Right. So I think it's already the case that that people are trying to work around it a little bit and try to come with new solutions. It's almost like grandmother's cake, right? Uh, everybody makes it a little bit different, but you know, it tastes uh, equally the same. <laughs> also, like how to establish the the compounds, like how to realize about the all the compounds that are present in the that are used in the in the mixture, you know, and how that affects the the effect, which we already we don't know yet about the whole compounds that are there. So, it seems pretty difficult indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also with ayahuasca, so that there's clear evidence that it can work as an antidepressant. Uh, but I, th I don't think it's demonstrated whether it's actually the DMT or the harmalines that causes it. And it might very well be the harmalines, right? Because there are Mayo A inhibitors, which, yep. we, which we know are antidepressants. Mm. I mean, actually, that's quite interesting, though, Jan. So, I, I mean, it might, it's, it might be that um, it's sort of repeated lower doses of ayahuasca might be antidepressant as much as one big dose. You know? yeah. It's an interesting comparison, wouldn't it, to sort of the macro dose and to midi dose and see, maintain the antidepressant efficacy with the MAOI to some extent adding to the, to the DMT. Yeah, I think that, that actually, I, I think that would be a good idea for any of these psychedelic compounds, right? So if you want, if you can see whether you can maintain an antidepressant response over time, with, I don't know, like a microdose or at least a low dose, right? It needs to be done, yeah, and it absolutely needs to be done, that experiment. I think so. I, I can't do it in Britain. Microdosing in Britain is still impossible because of the illegal status, but you guys could microdose repeatedly with truffles, I think. It'd be, I think it would be easier for you. Yeah, I think we could, indeed, yeah. And I think there are companies already working with microdosing and ayahuasca, I think. Sure. But they're not going to do it in Britain at present because the rules are just... We have to, to administer a microdose of anything. I mean, so this guy, you know, Ramaker's published the first microdose study on, on LSD, but we, ha we had ethical permission to do it four year, three years before him, but we could never get enough money because we had to put everyone into hospital every day. They took the microdose and keep them in hospital for, for eight hours while the microdose effect of LSD. So, you know, in Britain, we just can't, we couldn't do what he's done. And I'm glad you've done it, Jan, well done. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, yeah, it seems really difficult. Seems really difficult. Long way to go. Long That's why we've not done a microdosing study because it's just, it's just, well, we just can't get through the bureaucracy in Britain. And the final statement is um, what qualities would seek for in a beat stick candidate? Oh, right. Okay. So, um, well, the, I think intelligence is a, is a good place to start uh, and commitment, dedication, um, and loyalty, I think those those are those are four. Those are four I would take. And you, Dan? Will... Yeah, I would subscribe to all of those. I think uh, uh, writing skills are very important as an uh, additional uh, quality. And uh, yeah, and I think yeah, perseverance probably also because um, yeah, I mean, science is really a lot of fun, but 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 ninety five percent of it is just hard work and, and not always uh, exciting. Uh, and, and it's the five percent that make it all in the end worthwhile. So you have to realize that that there, there, there will be a lot lots of uh, ups and downs, and not every experiment is successful, not at all. Yeah, you need to be resilient. I think the other point I would say is that you. It's really important that you get on with other people. 
because the whole pro you get more out of your PhD from what your peers tell you than what you discover generally. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, the, yeah, indeed. And that's another point. I think at least these days, if you want to be successful in science, you need to collaborate. You can't, yeah. you can't stay in your laboratory anymore. That, that's way gone. Yeah. And uh, certainly in the, in the way that sciences are becoming more and more interdisciplinary, you need to rely on, on, on colleagues who have expertise that you don't have and that you want to combine in order to actually move ahead. And, uh, and and you know yeah. attack the, the frontiers. So I think collaboration, a collaborative spirit, really is very important. Absolutely, good interpersonal skills. Yeah, we we'll look. Which of course that. you Dutch have <laughs> in spades, because <laughs> you've had to get on with the rest of the world. You can't be insular. You know, you you're an international nation. If you went, if you isolated yourself like we've done, you'd just disappear. Whereas. Uh, hopefully we won't, but we may do. <laughs>